Assalamu alaikum dear viewers, peace be upon you all. Welcome to our next episode discussing the different aspects of Ashura, the lessons we learn from there and different aspects we can take from. Our topic today is going to be on the topic of brotherhood. The concept of brotherhood is a very big aspect of Islam in terms of maintaining unity and being at peace with one another. Obviously when it comes to brotherhood in Karbala, there's only really one name that comes to mind and that is Abbas, the brother of Imam Hussain and I'm sure he'll be featured very heavily in our discussion today. Joining us to discuss this topic of brotherhood are four brothers, uh, Sheikh Ali Marsh we have, we have Sayyid Mohsin Shah, Imran Datu and Tahir Adu. Welcome to you all. Sheikh, before we even get to brotherhood in Karbala, we know brotherhood is mentioned quite a lot in Islam as a concept. Um, just from my own knowledge, the word Ummah is used everywhere, um, both by the Prophet and in, in the Quran. So why does Islam place such a huge emphasis on this concept of brotherhood, not just with your neighbours, but globally? أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد The Holy Quran states clearly that بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما المؤمنون إخوة that that believing men and women are brothers to each other so Islam clearly states that the one should be the brother of the other uh, mu'min individual. And of course there are rights in terms of uh, the rights, the mutual rights between a mu'min and the other mu'min. And likewise with the sisters, the mu'min and her fellow mu'min as well. Um, of course the one who is more favorable and more respected in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has more piety and taqwa. Inna akramakum Allah atqakum. The one who has more taqwa than his status is, is higher than the others. Um, the hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he speaks about uh, the mu'min brotherhood. He says that the mu'min is the, the brother of the other mu'min. المؤمن أخو المؤمن وهو عينه he says that the مؤمن is the eye of the other مؤمن ومرآته and his mirror ودليله and his guide then he says the Imam عليه السلام لا يخونه he doesn't betray him ولا يخدعه and he doesn't cheat him or deceive him ولا يظلمه and he doesn't oppress him وَلَا يَكْذِبُهُ وَلَا يَغْتَابُهُ So he doesn't basically lie to him and he doesn't backbite him. These are the features of a mu'min uh, brotherhood that we have to observe in our daily life. Otherwise, um, we see today in, in the Muslim world, for example, especially in, the, in some markets and businesses that they cheat and lie and mm -hmm. in order to get a bit more profit and they don't know that this will be a burden on, on them when they die on the first day of their qabr. So brotherhood in Islam is so emphasized that uh, we have this clear verse in the Holy Quran and of course with regard to the ummah uh, with the one nation in Islam again that this ummah is uh, one ummah and I'm your Lord then worship me. So without brotherhood we cannot go forward Without brotherhood, we cannot achieve our goals as a Muslim uh, nation, as a Muslim community. Uh, we have to be all in one hand. And um, as they say, one hand cannot clap. Mm. So you have to have two hands to clap in, in order to clap. So we have to make sure that we have this brotherhood implemented practically and pragmatically in, this, in, in our daily life, in all aspects, beginning from the Islamic centers and mosques and Husseini and so forth, and going all the way to the schools and colleges and workplace and, and so forth. So we have to have uh, this issue raised and spoken about. Mm. Okay. Um, let's now let's now focus on Karbala. Um, and I can speak to I can speak for many people. Um, when it comes to brotherhood, as I said in the intro, only one person does come to mind, and we can look at perhaps when he was born. 
where you know there's this idea that some people say that he did not even open his eyes until Imam Hussein held him as a baby. And then it became possibly official when Imam Ali passed away, when Imam Ali informed him that you have to look after Hussein um, after I die. So it was instilled upon him. But just maybe this is more of your opinion. What are the moments from Abbas's life where you see the definition of brotherhood? I mean, I know you guys as poets and reciters as well, there's several lines of poetry that talk about he's the definition of brotherhood and loyalty. And that's used quite a lot. But how do we see this? This is, this is in brotherhood in the simple sense. This is on a different level that even I can't comprehend, um, pondering on it on my whole life. Say Moss, and how would you add to this? I mean, the, the brotherhood is special. And let's not forget, Imam Ali السلام, had 18 sons. Mm. So there's a lot of brothers. But specifically, the brotherhood of Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein and Abu Fadl Abbas with Imam Hussein and with Sayyidah Zainab. Mm. Th that sibling bond is very, very unique and very, very special. Uh, we see it from, from you know, a young age. With Abu, Abu Fadl, you know, and, and, and as he's growing up, attached to the side of Imam Hussein, mm. and as you mentioned on the deathbed of Imam Ali alayhi salam, he puts Imam Hussein's hand in the hands of Abu Fadl that you are to take care of, of Imam Hussein. And further, even in, uh, in in the actual story of Karbala, there's so many events. But one thing that really you know, touches me, and one thing that, and it's not mentioned a lot is when Abu Fadl actually goes on top of the Kaaba yeah, and he gives a sermon. Absolutely. And you know, we, we, always, we don't hear much of Abu Fadl mm. in his speech. We always think he's a silent warrior. It's an amazing sermon. We do yeah, encourage he, the, reader, exactly. uh, the viewers to really look it up. And, and, and there he really like, you know, um, you know, lays down the foundations of, of his, his Aqeedah. And also he's kind of like sh exposing the enemy and what's happening. And then he's there to, to tell them that, okay, you know, if, if this is how it's going to be, then let's go for it. Mm. And for me, that's, this is so inspiring, so motivational, and I think a lot more needs to be mm. put onto just that, that one sermon. That one ser there's that one line in that sermon where he just says, if you want to get to my brother, you have to go through me. Exactly. I mean, that's such a simple line, but when you mm. actually unpack it and think about it, it's one of the most deepest lines. And actually, you talked about it explaining your Aqidah. Actually, maybe this is a relation we have to have with our current Imam as well, that mm. to keep our Imam safe as well, you have to get through his followers and the brother yeah. that was shown there. Um, what do you guys? How do you, how do you view Abbas and brotherhood um, as reciters and poets, but also as just as a as a human being? Yeah, I think um, the personality of Hazrat Abbas it's um, like you said, it's on a, another level. Especially for me, if we look specifically with the bond he had with Imam Hussein he reads, um, you know, and we've seen a lot of poetry as well that um, it's uh, you know he's he's said to, and it's in fact it's a fact as well that he throughout his life he never referred to Imam Hussein as mm -hmm. his brother but his master. Mm -hmm. So to actually give someone respect of calling them the master actually shows th how much love there is involved as well as how much respect there is. And we see that in Karbala as well where Hazrat Abba, you know, Abu Fadl is given a task of being the Alamdar, of being the flag bearer and you know he had that one, he had that like he, he had he was itching to go and fight but he was told you know this is your role we need you to, uh, you know, at the uh, critical moment when he went to get the water for the uh, children. And, and, you know, the love and respect he had for his brother, Imam Hussein, was so much that no matter what faced him, what, what his surroundings were, at the, in the battlefield, he still stayed silent and he still just mm. followed his main task. And that in itself shows the personality, how, how strong the personality of Abu Fadl Abbas is. Um, and why he is, you know, uh, regarded as high as he is today because mm. of that loyalty, because of that respect. Mm. I think a lot of credit has to go to his mother as well, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Benin, yeah. Who, who helped raise him and Absolutely. also, like, you know, mm. instilled these virtues in and him. I, himself. I was going to say, you know, so. you know, pardon my informal language, but it was drummed into him mm -hmm. since he was born that yeah. Yeah. you you only serve this person, mm -hmm. and that was drummed into him, and you see it him in his childhood and as he grows up. Dyer, as, a, as a, someone who writes poetry, and I'm sure you've drawn several inspiration from, from this figure, um, how do you relate to Abbas and Brotherhood and what do you draw from him? I think it's his unique selflessness that makes him perfect for poetry because mm. he can write and write about Abbas and not finish mm. uh, because so. he's there for the taking. He's a hero in, 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 all, its, uh, uh, in all its definition. So you've got a, a character who is pretty much a star of the show. So if it was a, a movie, for instance, this person is the star mm. of the show, Qamar Bani Hashim. Mm. So he was not even, he was a star of the clan as well. Uh, yet he lowered himself and, and was, uh, wanted to be in, in the shadow of Mahab Hussain. 
my mom had said at the end of the day was an aging man. He was, mm, he was the yeah. imam of the time, but also was an aging man. Uh, Abbas was in his peak at the time. The enemies and the families would look, look at him and he would be the star, yet he'd lower his, himself. And that selflessness was quite unique. Mm. And, that, and it all goes down to your point about the upbringing. So Umm al the way she raised him, it's a lesson for us. So it's not only uh, a lesson for us in, in Western environments as well, but also mm -hmm. Eastern environments as well. So how yeah. can you raise a son or a daughter to be selfless to a brother? Uh, mm -hmm. And even if it's not knowing the brothers and imam, for instance, that selfless nature was there. Uh, so even if Imam Hassan wasn't an imam, I reckon Abbas would be equally the same and, and, you know, uh, and be there for his brother. Mm. Sheikh, how, on, on the day of Ashura, how does, how does this figure of Abbas demonstrate the idea of wilaya and obeying your imam and how can we take from that because um, I find and I can maybe speak for myself here because others may not struggle Abbas had Imam Hussein in front of him and he was able to almost obey the imam because but we have an imam that we can't see with our eyes how are we be able to obey the imam and show the same brotherhood and loyalty to our current imam interesting they mentioned in the maqatil of Imam Hussein alayhi salam that when the cursed shimmer brought immunity from, I think, Ibn Ziyad, that uh, Al-Abbas is immune and his brothers immune from being killed mm -hmm. if, they, if they leave the camp of al Hussein alayhi salam because between uh, shimmer and uh, the mother of Al-Abbas alayhi salam, Bani, there was some kind of relation in terms of the, the tribes from Bani Kilab basically. Yeah. So they had some, some links with there. So he brought this Im immunity to, to basically to drag Al-Abbas towards the enemy side so they can easily kill al Hussein because so they knew how Abbas was strong and he could face the whole army easily. But Al-Abbas was sitting and never said anything because al Hussein was there alayhi salam. Mm. So Imam said to him, Ajibhu, when can a fasiqa? You know, respond to him, although he is uh, corrupt. So Abbas, he gets up and he goes and he responds back to uh, Shimmer and he rejects his uh, letter of immunity. And this is how Abbas obeys his master. He doesn't do any act, any action without the permission from Al Hussein. Although the, um, uh, he, was, he was called personally to talk to Shimmer, but he rejected. And uh, subhanAllah, this is the loyalty and the sincerity towards his brother Al Hussein Al that any act would be done through uh, the obedience of Al Hussein. It's quite interesting because um, we sometimes, and I'm sure you guys would agree, that when we look at these special figures of history, we stop looking at them as human beings. But sometimes, if we humanize them a bit more, we can think that actually Abbas, when Imam gave an order, he clearly would have had the ego versus the order, but he always obeyed the order of the Imam. Um, he never ever obeyed himself and it's quite fascinating and as per the format of the show we're going to uh, break with some poetry for our viewers and for us at the studio and no better figure than to um, uh, recite poetry about so brother Tari please um, give us some poetry about this amazing figure I've heard many stories passed by whispering tongues that cannot stop and I've read many books written in ink that cannot fade stories of great men and legends and myths alike but none have entranced me the way this one man has this man was a seed sown by Ali to adorn the fragrant garden of his household this man was born from a womb of an equally heroic woman this man was a hero and if heroes were pillars we'd all be resting in his shadow this man is an immaculate specimen of his father but he did not need his father's double-edged sword to be great. For his double helix DNA moved him like the shadow of Ali in battle and raised him like a moon in the cascades of Shana darkness. Allah. So much so they called him the Hashemite moon, Qamar mm. Bani Hashem. But what makes heroes eternal is the legacy they leave behind. And this man used death itself to write his very own. Just like how the sun does not fail to rise for us and four seasons in a year does not surprise us. With autumn leaves falling to the ground gracefully around us, with the spring bearing fruits for us. Just like the consistent nature of clockwork, Abbas too will welcome us annually. Because eternity fell in love with his broken heart. 
Just as we fell in love with his punctured pride, just as the ground fell in love with his bleeding hands and the skies reddened in awe in the collapsing darkness of his eyes, while the angels hovered down in remembrance of his thirsty tongue. And it was as if it was yesterday, it was as if it was yesterday when the water was trapped between the closings of his fingers and his mind was trapped between Zainab and Sukaina. He questioned, how can a mountain drink from the clouds when the sun is out of sight? He threw the water away in defiance, concluding his life on the lap of his very own brother, asking for forgiveness. He said, forgive me that I cannot see you. For when the water quenched my eyes, an arrow took them away. Forgive me that I cannot hold you, for when the water cooled my palms, the swords upon them prayed. Forgive me that I cannot protect you, for when I cried, Ya Nafs min ba'dil Hussein, horny, my soul surrendered to fate. Because I would rather die on your lap than see your severed head on mine, although I take the reverse. And that's the poem about her. Um, Imran, if we look at the story of Abbas, there are several moments that we can all pick, which I say the moment he becomes immortal. Mm. And you can go from the start to the end, and all of us can say something, and they're all the right answer in a sense. Um, one that stands out to me is, um, and Tahir referenced it in his poem, where Abbas starts reciting poetry with his arm cut off and there's one line where he says I'm going to protect my religion and the way I read that line is that he's calling Imam Hussein his religion mm. in a sense because Imam Hussein is an embodiment of what it means to be committed to God and from your opinion what, do you, what is the moment that stands out to you the most um, where this is the moment he becomes the Abbas that he is today? I think with, um, with that personality, like you said, there, there are so many moments that you can pick from. But uh, I think the thing that hits me the most is, um, and we, again, uh, there are several poets that put it very, uh, really nicely, that, and, and coming to Said Mohsen's point about um, his bond with his other siblings too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with, uh, with say, the Zainab um, especially. So he, she referred when his arms are cut off, she referred to him as, she referred, used to refer to him as the one who would protect um, her hijab. So he was known to her uh, as the one who protects the hijab. So once his hands were cut off, um, and you know, there's some poetry, uh, it's not meant to be taken literally, but there, it, it's said that, you know, she picks up the arms and puts it on her head because it's that protection, yeah. yeah, because, you know, they were, their hijabs were taken away. Um, but that's, you know, when someone looks at you like that, when someone um, sees you in that light that they are, you know, you kind of put your full trust in them to protect you, to protect your hijab. And the hijab is a, um, it's, it's the modesty of a woman. It, it, it almost becomes, it defines you as a person. So in essence, you know, Sayyidah Zainab is being protected, her definition is being protected by Al-Abbas, her brother. So that in itself is quite a strong, strong statement for me. And it's, a, it, yeah, that's when I think that, you know, what, as, as, uh, as Al-Abbas had something that a normal person doesn't, you know, there is that like, and it, it again builds up to his loyalty, his respect for his master and his respect for his sister yeah. in that sense. Yeah. So I think that, that's something that really sticks yeah. with me. Yeah. But, but, sorry, what about you? What's the, what's the one moment? where it just, it just wows you? It's the moment where he held the water. Mm. I think that wows most people, but that specific moment uh, touches something in me that, you know, I try to write about it, but then I can only refer to it in a couple of verses because it's so powerful and I can't encapsulate it in any, anything more than a couple of verses. Mm. But that particular moment strikes me as uh, where Abbas manifests his, uh, the epitome of mm. Abbas, mm. really. And it's that moment he converses with himself as well. Exactly. And I'm sure a lot of poetry is written exactly. about that. Yes. Sayyid Mohsen, one of the things that Imam calls Abbas is his back, or his yes. backbone. And when he famously dies or, or falls to the ground, uh, Imam says, my back has now been broken. And again, we have to, uh, and again, I remind myself all the time, when the, the Imams of, of the Prophet's house speak, they pick their words quite carefully. And when I think about the role of the back to the human body. If the back doesn't work, you're paralyzed, um, in a sense. How was, how was Abbas the backbone to Imam? Well, in many ways, I mean, he was the backbone. If you look at backbone, what is it? It's support, it's the foundation. 
um, it's where everything is linked to and without it you cannot actually maneuver mm -hmm. nothing can progress Sent. so with having Abu Fadl with uh, the Imam not just that he was a protector he was there to, to, to serve uh, the army and also to, to serve the children and, and to serve the, the women there but in a way he was also a symbol of hope though you know if you thought about it Imam Hussein is going out and time after time he's bringing one body back he's bringing another body back but they, the camp still had hope because they had Abu mm. Fadl Abbas. They could look up to him and say, mm. like, yes, we still have... It's like when you get in trouble, if you've got that the, special person around, you're like, it's going to be okay. It's going to yeah. be fine, it's going to yeah. be okay. So, you know, in a way, he was that backbone of hope, that backbone of that, you know, everything's going to be okay. But when, you know, Imam Hussein lost Abu Fadl, you know, I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, Sheikh, but they say that even his tent, they went and they took the, the main foundation of the tent out and the tent collapsed yeah. mm. as a symbol that he's not coming back. Mm. And then it was from there, you know, you could really encompass that this is a true tragedy and, and you know, God knows what's going to happen next. Mm. 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 Sheikh, you touched upon earlier that conversation between um, Shimmer and Abbas. And um, I understand that they were some form of cousin relation, possibly, yes. uh, yes. due to the tribe of um, Azad Abbas's mother. Um, this also brings in this, this topic of keeping family relations, um, which we know is a very big aspect of Islam, and Islam hugely encourages to keep ties with your family and blood relatives. Um, does perhaps a bar show that there has to be a time where we do have to cut off, and what kind of lessons can we learn from that? Because I'm sure all of us might struggle with family members that might not be, you know, maybe as godly as they should be in the sense of their practice. Um, where do we draw this line and what does Abbas teach us? Basically, um, in the Sharia, it is forbidden for the one to cut his ties with his relatives, which is called Qati'atul Rahim. Yeah. It's, it's forbidden. Um, but the problem is, it begins from the other side when they take a different route from the right path. Um, that's why Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he advised Umar ibn Sa'ad many times to stop uh, shedding the blood of the household of the Prophet sallallahu but he refused. He wanted uh, some interests. You know, he was given the, uh, the promise for, to become the governor of uh, Ray City just on the outskirts of Tehran uh, in Iran. Um, so he insisted that he, want, he wants that power, he wants that position, even if it costs to kill Imam Hussain So the Imam, he made a dua against him that قَدْ Allah رَحِمَكَ كَمَا قَطَعْتَ رَحْمِ That may Allah sever uh, your uh, rahim, your relation, as you did with my, uh, you know, by killing Ali al-Akbar and so forth. So, Yes, of course, uh, when it comes to this point, then that's it. And there is a narration that, um, uh, that uh, one in one of the uh, sermons in Ashura, that if the swords are raised between the two sides, khalas, there's no more um, uh, peace and no more uh, you know, re relationships. Khalas. There's a war, there's a bloodshed. So the Imam salam, had to take this step that this individual is not worth of being as a relative. Mm. And so that, I remember the time of Rasulullah there was, you know, fathers on one side fighting against their sons mm. and also vice versa, brother fighting brother. So, you know, like the Sheikh said, when swords are raised, you know, all family ties mm. are cut. It's hard, isn't it? And it, it, and it, 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 it it's a big challenge, I mean, to stand up to you. To go against family members is one of the hardest challenges. We have also with Imam Ali and Talha and Zubair, yeah. his cousins, and yeah. there, was, there was a moment they actually spoke and they were crying, like, what was, what's happening? Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. And I think before we get to the last bit where the eulogy is, um, one of the things that people look at is, um, and a common excuse that is used is, um, I can't be like Imam, he was infallible. Um, with Abbas, he didn't have that traditional infallibility that is bestowed upon the Ahlul Bayt. He maybe had a different form of it. But how, how that lesson we get from how can we get from Abbas that you don't have to be quote unquote infallible to become someone that close to God? How 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 do you relate how do you relate to this? So in the, we automatically have to relate it back to our lives, as in these lessons are there for us to take, not just as 
uh, lessons for our intentions, but also for us to verbalize and actually manifest mm -hmm. in our day-to-day, -day, whether we've got siblings, I've got three siblings, we argue on a day-to-day -day basis. So we should be using the examples of Abu Fadl al-Abbas and Imam Hussein as, as, role, as, as brotherhood role models, mm -hmm. as how we should approach each other, put that selfless nature between <coughs> us. So our arguments shouldn't mean much in the grand scheme of things and, and carry those ties through mm. to us uh, yeah. through the years as well. So. I, I, I always think that one of the ways is, is to look towards if the Imams, we see them as too high up, their companions, however, they are yeah. immortal today yeah. because of the devotion they showed. Mm. Um, and that's a, that's a nice way to wrap up. We would like to thank our viewers for joining us today uh, and watching the show on Brotherhood. Clearly the message is um, quite apparent that if you want to look at what the word brotherhood means, you turn to no one but the brother of Imam Hussain, Hazrat Abbas, for he showed brotherhood that no man can ever show uh, in the history of mankind or in the future. We'd like to end this show with our traditional poetry um, to close uh, for the viewers at home. So, Bismillah Imran. Hassan, so, um, so this poem again is reflecting on um, uh, a point I made earlier, how Hazrat Abbas was um, given a set role, a set instruction, um, especially when going towards the battlefield to get the water for the children. And this is after Hazrat Abbas has passed away, and, it, and it's a conversation from uh, Sakina or Sayyidah Ruqayya in some relations, uh, narrations, um, speaking to Abu Fadl Abbas. <coughs> there came a time when there was no response You left me alone And now you've already gone I missed you And now it is too late I need you but now I can't see straight And this is why I bring to you A message that has never been told A message that the world has seen The seventh heaven cry on And this is where I give to you A message from Sakina to Abbas There came a time where you had gone And left me all alone My feelings, you raised them and now I'm all exposed I saw you, we saw you Now where do I begin? The children are waiting Now where do I begin? The skies look down upon all atrocities The water looked up waiting for you to reach I saw your face before you left and now I feel so cold My feelings, you raised them And now I'm all exposed I looked up and stood up Praying for your return I looked down and sat down my life for you, I'll yearn Hoping, crying, waiting for you to turn my cheeks Soon now will face the burning pain 
I saw your arms divide in two, and now I can't behold my feelings. You raised them, and now I'm all exposed. My lion, my uncle, your story is untold. You loved me and left me when I was uncontrolled. Time passed, it didn't last forever. In our shadows, my enemy, your enemy, did not give any remorse. I saw my father bring you back, and now my life has sold my feelings. You raised them, and now I'm all exposed. There's fear now, it's clear now, his eyes have fallen red. No hope then, no hope now, just like my father said. Your arms, his eyes, are for the love of one. On my own, I stand alone with the bright and burning sun. I sent you there for your return, but I was never told my feelings. You raised them, and now I'm all exposed. There came a time where you had gone, and left me all alone. My feelings, you raised them, and now I'm all exposed. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad.